This is a quick video, a tour of the Conjure architecture along with a demonstration of its high availability capabilities. So first and foremost, the applications always have to get their secrets. So that's the job of any secrets management system is applications run continuously. There's lots and lots of them. So this, the, any solution that purports to be a secrets management solution has to scale and has to be highly resilient to various forms of failure. So in the CyberArk architecture, the vault is the system of record for secrets. CyberArk six secrets management solutions are a way of extending the reach of the vault into the application space. Uh, a big part of their job is to insulate uh, the vault from getting hit uh, with application requests. So they serve requests, they pull secrets or, or, or source their secrets from the core vault, uh, but in many cases they cache or otherwise uh, relieve a lot of that activity from going back to the core vault. And as we'll see with Conjure, extends the reach of the vault across the extended enterprise into cloud regions, Kubernetes, uh, various other places that applications can be running. So that's the role of CyberArk Secrets Management and Conjure in particular. If we look at the architecture of Conjure, it is a multi-node architecture. Each node is a Docker container and is self-contained, has its own self-contained storage, en encrypted storage, uh, a, an Nginx server to receive REST calls, as well as the, the Conjure uh, service logic is in there. So we call these appliances. Each node is an instance of the Conjure appliance image. Uh, and there's a leader node. There's exactly one leader per cluster, per Conjure cluster. There are standbys, which provide redundancy for the leader. And then there are followers, which are read replicas of the leader. So the cluster is kept in sync with the core vault through a synchronization process that runs intermittently and will push any changes made in the core vault to the leader node where they're immediately replicated to all the other nodes in the cluster. So the cluster is kept in sync through this synchronization and replication process uh, as new safes or new accounts are added to safes in the core vault uh, or passwords are changed, then those changes will be pushed on the next synchronizer run. Uh, so the cluster is kept in sync with the vault and in in a real, very real sense, you can think of Conjure as just a way of extending the reach of the vault. Applications get their secrets from their local follower. So they will authenticate, authorize, and their activity be audited by the follower. And the follower can function somewhat independently of the leader node. If, the, if there's a network partition or, or other uh, event that causes the follower to lose connectivity with the leader node, applications can still get their secrets from their follower. Followers are designed to be placed close to where applications are running so that applications aren't making long distance calls across firewall boundaries. They're calling their local follower. So that, that's where we talk about accessibility. It's an accessible service. Followers really are the point of presence for this service. It's highly scalable because being read only, access is read only to followers. So there is no session state that has to be preserved. An application may authenticate to one follower, retrieve secrets from another follower. So the solution can be scaled horizontally. You can put followers behind load balancers, use auto scaling from Kubernetes or cloud platforms, uh, or just you know good old manual automation to scale that that's the the uh, service out horizontally. So if you need more capacity, you can add more followers. If you need less capacity, you can retire followers. So that's the scalability aspect, and then availability. You know, being uh, resilient to disconnection and also having that redundancy especially if a follower is behind a load balancer, then you can do things like upgrade one follower while the other follower is still serving secrets uh, and have that redundancy there. So the key to availability is, is redundancy, no single point of failure, um, and having then uh, failover protocols. So at the follower level, uh, failover is really achieved just through load balancing uh, so that the applications don't have to be aware of which follower they're talking to. They're talking to their local follower service which may have two or more followers uh, supporting it. Uh, the, the leader cluster though, this, the subcluster that contains the leader typically has two standbys. So this is using the raft consensus protocol uh, built or implemented through etcd uh, where you need an odd number in this cluster. So, so setting up for auto failover, which is an option, uh, we recommend starting with manual failover uh, just to get your your sea legs, as it were, um, and understanding how failover is going to work in your environment. Automation doesn't always make great decisions. 
you may set the time to live to be too short and get spurious failovers. So we always recommend starting with manual failover, but auto failover is an option that we're going to demo here. Um, however you trigger failover, or however failover is achieved, what happens is the leader node is uh, becomes unavailable for some period of time uh, and is deemed uh, no longer functional. It's evicted from the cluster and one of the standbys is promoted to be the new leader. Now the leaders uh, and standbys we also put behind the load balancer and we use a health checking load balancer. So before I leave this slide, I just want to point out that the general flow of secrets is out to the followers. But as followers authenticate, authorize, uh, and authorize access to secrets, as applications retrieve secrets from their followers, they're recording audit information that is forwarded back to the leader node for a consolidated audit log. So you have visibility into how secrets are being used across the entire cluster at the leader node. Um, and so that, that information flows back this way. So looking at a more detailed example, uh, including load balancers now, we see that there's a health checking load balancer in front of the leader cluster. So this is the cluster that in, in the demo environment is set up for auto failover. We won't have a DR standby here. This is not part of the auto failover cluster uh, or, or would not be in, a, in the real world example. But the health checking basically just routes traffic to the active leader node. The standbys are purely passive. They do not serve any other purpose than to provide redundancy to the leader. And that way, if there is a failover event and one of the standbys becomes the new leader, then the followers and the applications, any applications that may be connecting to the leader, such as the synchronizer, don't have to be reconfigured. They don't have to change their DNS name or IP addresses or anything else. Um, the, load, the, the health checking loan balancer will simply route traffic to the new leader when that leader becomes available. So this sets us up. You see we, we've got uh, followers deployed in pairs here. We always recommend deploying them in pairs. You can see we were representing that they're running in a cloud region behind a load balancer, on-prem behind a load balancer, within a Kubernetes cluster behind a load balancer. So these are just options that you have. Um, but you can see how scalable this is. We have customers running uh, dozens and dozens of followers in their cluster. So uh, it truly makes the core vault highly scalable, scalable across potentially multiple cloud regions, even multiple cloud providers, um, as well as your on-prem data centers. So enough with slides, let's uh, look at a demo environment. So here I've got a Conjure cluster stood up. You see here, this is my load balancer, the HA proxy node. This is all done in, in Docker, so this is just simulating what you would do in a real world example, but it's, it's a truly uh, truly demonstrative of the of the functionality. Conjure 1, 2, and 3, these are the nodes of my cluster. Conjure 1 is the current leader. Conjure 2 and 3 are standbys. This is looking into the logs of those three uh, nodes. So top is Conjure 1, Conjure 2, and Conjure 3. Uh, here we see the UI. Now the UI is connected to the leader node through the load balancer. I had to think about what I'm typing here. So you can see that as I do activity in this window here, it's, it's triggering act, activity in the log for that current leader node. Uh, so as I look at secrets, then uh, that's reflected here. What we're going to do is we're going to run an application up here called get password. This just sits in a loop and every five seconds retrieves this password here. So if we look at it here, we can see that that's that value. If we change this value here and just put some garbage things in here, basically rotate the secret. Now, typically this would be done by that synchronizer process. I don't currently have that set up, uh, but we can affect the same by changing that value. And so when I trigger, when I save that, that's triggered, it's, it's replicated to the follower. And you see the next iteration picks up that changed value. Uh, so this is an active cluster uh, where the, 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 the leader node is uh, immediately replicating changes to the follower node this application is connected to the follower. So what we're going to do is we're going to trigger uh, failover by stopping the conjure node. We're simply going to make the conjure node unavailable. Now this will take a minute. I've set a time to live on this for a minute. Um, I'm going to pause the video just so you don't have to sit here. So I'm going to hit return. I'm going to pause the video. We'll be right back. So I haven't, it hasn't uh, started kicking in. The uh, standbys haven't started to elect a leader here. Here they go. Uh, so they're standing by. Uh, they're now attempting to promote, looking for a leader, looking, racing to promotion. 
Conjure 3 won the election, so Conjure 3 will be a new leader node. But notice the application is still retrieving secrets. Even while this uh, environment is not available, so I'm not able to use the browser because the browser is connected to what was the leader node, and the, the, the new leader isn't available yet, the application is still retrieving secrets. So once that Conjure 3 is promoted to be the new leader, uh, this UI will become available again, and we will be able to resume normal functionality. Uh, so this is, you can see now Conjure 3 acting as a master. Uh, Standby 2 is now uh, rebasing to the new, the new leader. Uh, and then uh, eventually our, our UI comes back and we have a fully functional node, including that change secret value down here uh, in the password. So we can see here that that's the same value. Replicate, it was replicated to the standby while the leader was still active. And of course, that state is available now. So the point is the application can always get its secret. The Conjure architecture is highly scalable uh, to support uh, highly distributed and highly scaled environments. So it can, it can service a very high demand of, of uh, application uh, activity uh, while still uh, relieving that from the core vault. Um, but again, the core, core point here is that the applications can always get their secrets.